this for? The um, holes. The, so that one there is stainless steel. This one's titanium. Oh, wow. It's crazy, right? Wow. Um, the holes, like I said, prototype. I was kind of messing around with like, what, you know, what kind of key loop, key chain. Gotcha. Paracord, whatever. Wow, that's crazy. It's, it's And so these, the stainless ones, were like really chunky. So that's kind of when I changed the design and just uh, milling out the middle. Okay. So I got a buddy that has a uh, a lathe. So he's help, he's turning these for me, and we're figuring out, like... Um, it's crazy. Yeah. It's, dude, and what I told him was, like, I want to get the titanium, like, spooky light. Yeah. Because you know, yeah. everyone knows how light titanium is. Well, I didn't it's... really had, had my hands on too much of it, but, yeah, it's yeah. definitely light. It's yeah, insane. But, and so that one, that one's a gift for you. Oh, friend. thanks. Uh, Appreciate that. Yeah, and use it. Let me know. I will. Because it's... So my, I got to dial ring. in length, kind of... For sure. All that stuff, and then... The feature that I always tell people is that the, you know, so bottle bottle caps easy, but this you can slide under can tabs super easy. Yeah, because I, I chew the shit on my nails, and <laughs> tear them up, so, so I can't, or sometimes I can't get them open. That's yeah, legit. So I used to uh, I used to bartend a little bit in college, and same thing. Like when you start reaching into those, we, we did like mobile events, uh -huh. so you'd reach into those fucking jockey boxes yeah. and just the like the ice chests. Yeah. Of, after like an hour, your thumbnail just starts folding back. Yeah. I was like, man, I oh, got it. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's pretty smart. Right? So this, it just, you know, just slide it under there, pop it. Appreciate that um, very much. Yeah. So get some use out of it. Nice. My ADD hands will probably play with it while we, uh, while we talk. Yeah. It's, uh, sometimes that helps, honestly. It helps yeah. me just having something to focus on. Yeah. 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 For sure. So. Cool. cool. Um, well, yeah, we are back with another episode of the Apollo Road podcast. I've got David Kimball here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate you. Yeah, of course. Um, where do I want to start here? Because you've done quite a few interesting things in your life. But uh, when I met you, we were doing some brewery work, I think. And uh, you just immediately struck me as a guy. It's like, man, this guy's got his shit together. He just seems, <laughs> you know, seems like he's got it all figured out. So Some ways I do, some ways I don't, just like everyone, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, start us off, uh, I guess, whatever you want to start with in your career. Uh, yeah, I've been brewing actually next week is seven years. So professionally, um, started, well, I, uh, I, I went to school here. I'm, I'm a native New Mexican, start, okay. uh, went to UNM, uh, had a business down the South Valley, uh, for almost four years, uh, met my partner in a, in a business class and, uh, it was kind of a liquidation company, uh, did well, uh, for several years, started to fall off, uh, didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and. Uh, you know, had a buddy back in the oil field business in, in Farmington, uh, mm -hmm. wanted to open a brewery up there. And I said, well, I guess I'll uh, try and get a brewery job and we'll partner up on this. And uh, started at uh, Kelly's Brew Pub, which was uh, at the oh, time yeah. definitely uh, not known for the best beer, <laughs> let's just say. And, uh, but it, it got me my, uh, you know, my start and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, so learned how to do everything in for the most part there uh, in a lot of ways the wrong way, but yeah. realized that wasn't where I was going to learn. Right. And uh, moved on to Santa Fe brewing um, worked up there for about a year. Cool. Um, learned more of the production side, uh, biggest brewery in the state and still is. Um, uh, got tired of driving back and forth and doing night shifts uh, uh, mm. in Santa Fe overnight and just, just wasn't me. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, realized I lived right up the street from here. Also right up the street from, Another pretty good brewery uh, called La Cumbre, um, Cumbre Brewing Company, and uh, decided I was gonna. It just happened to send them an email one time asking if they had, inquiring if they had any kind of uh, brewery positions, and sure enough, they did. So nice. Moved over there, uh, learned to re re brew right uh, under Irway Jeff Irway, who's the owner, um, and really, uh, in my opinion, that's a world class brewery. Uh, just learned so much there, um, you know. So. I'm very grateful for that opportunity and uh, learned learned learn the ropes. So, and I always still had this goal of uh, wanting to open a brewery. Uh, moved on and did uh, Bombs Away, uh, which was uh, a partnership I had for several years. I decided to leave there and uh, was approached by Sidetrack Brewing um, and have been there almost almost two years. So doing that and then I'm also an instructor over at the CNM Brewing Program, which somehow some way I got I got lucky <laughs> enough to get that I. Happened to apply and uh, 
I got a call one day and said, well, meet us here and you're, you're, you're hired. And I said, no. Okay, cool. Sweet. And uh, my boss texted me, got a whole, asked me later. She's like, "What was your interview day?" I said, "I never had an interview." <laughs> so somehow I got the job, and I don't know. I've learned to teach, and I and I really enjoy that. So it's fun, dude. That's a good. That's a good run right there. I mean, <clears throat> and it's interesting. Like my first thought was, it's only now um, we're only now starting to have education programs specifically for beer. Sure. Because I remember been a few. There's been, been a few for a while, but okay. But very, now it's like every. It seems like every college, every community yeah. college, like yeah. they're throwing it in the mix. Yeah, whereas, there's a lot of them coming. Yeah, on. that's. Uh, so it's kind of cool that you were like there, yeah. right? As it was. Yeah, yeah. I just I'm always one to put myself out there, and yeah. uh, I guess it worked out in that situation. So. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Well, um, what was it like transitioning from different breweries, and because I know that it gets complicated once you get in. A new, you know, a new brewery. They've already established their business, their flavor, their yeah. range. Yeah. Um, what was it like just bouncing around and just getting used to the styles? Um, you know, Sidetrack was uh, be the biggest place. I mean, I kind of we set the thing from bombs away at the beginning. Uh, that's where I really was like the guy that determined what the mm. the what way things would go. Uh, Sidetrack had a very uh, English uh, focus, English beer focus. I'm big fan of that. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the styles sometimes aren't the hottest sellers. Um, IPA is king. Um, I learned to brew. Still. Still. <laughs> still. Like 30% of craft beer sells is IPA, something okay. like that, you know. Um, so I learned to brew IPA pretty well uh, from La Cumbre. Uh, they have award-winning IPA brewery. Um, so I had a good feel for what IPA should be um, and what sells well. Um so have developed a couple, uh, I guess, a flagship IPA down there, base camp. Um, still dialing that in uh, gradually. Um, so kind of brought in a you know, more modern feel, putting it in a lot of lager beer. Lager beer is my passion, which is many other brewers' passion. But uh, we're, we're, we're ultimately a beer-flavored beer brewery. There's a lot of tendency nowadays to... Uh, cover up, or I shouldn't, cover up's the wrong word, but uh, throw a lot of random ingredients in the beer. Uh, cool, whatever. That's a lot of a lot of people love that. Mm -hmm. um, that's not us. Uh, we 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 focus on beer flavored beer. God made four great ingredients: malt, water, yeast, and hops. <laughs> and the ability yep. to uh, mish mash and mix and match all those uh, gives you a huge range of, of 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 different varieties of beer to make. So I I, I appreciate more nuanced feel to beer and. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's how we focus on beer. Cool. That um, I have a buddy that he, when we were in college together, he interned at New Belgium. Okay. And he did kind of their, he actually took a year off school just to f work there essentially. Uh -huh. um, and he kind of, he taught us a lot of stuff um, that, you know, when you're in college, you're not necessarily wanting to learn all of the history and the lore and the really specific uh, for each style. But one thing that he told me back in, and this was like in 20, uh, between 2012 and 2014, so we're in there. Mm -hmm. He told me that brewing a like world, a world class lager is so difficult because you have nothing to like, you, I mean, mask Fine. is kind of the appropriate word in this case. Correct. You, there's nothing helping you. You got to get it right. And yep. it's a balance. And yep. he said, that's why like a lot of, it's just hard. It's really hard to like Extremely perfect hard. one and then produce it consistently and keep it on your menu. And yeah. um, I think, and this is funny. He's like, yeah, I mean, Budweiser, there's a reason why it's like king of beers. Cause for it's like what, one of the only American or like one of the longest uh, produced American lagers. That's sure, yeah. Technically, very well produced. Sure, you know? yeah. It's, I mean, those those big guys. A lot of people, uh, craft beer nerds and such, like to trash them, but um, they've fueled a lot of the research that craft brewers mm -hmm. use, uh, funded it, and um, you know they 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 have really they make a, a flawless product. Uh, sure, it's uh, full of corn and rice and uh, cheap adjunct ingredients, uh, but. Uh, their consistency is above anybody else's, so there's it's hard to really knock them. Mm -hmm. um, I appreciate them a lot. Yeah, and that's um, <clears throat> it's funny. I've come full circle uh, when I was in college. You know, I tried all the different flavored styles, and uh, I like stouts. I like porters. I was I like fifteen fifty four from yeah. Belgium. Um, I kind of stayed there for a couple of years, mm -hmm. branched out, mm -hmm. and now I I'm kind of back on like I like. Um, 
kind of more balanced, milder, middle of the road type beers. For sure. I'll have an IPA every now and then, but uh, it's funny. It's just full circle back yeah, to just the same way. Bloggers you know, and, I was uh, in college. Uh, a friend of mine worked at uh, Jubilation, a local oh, yeah. uh, a beer place here, a beer uh, store, a liquor store. And uh, he would bring us home all the fancy pants, you know, beer. And we would just think we were like, you know, IPA, Stone IPA this. Oh, yeah. Stuff that nobody else <laughs> get their hands on. We thought we were in heaven. Looking back, that beer is probably very, very old and some of it very flawed. Who knows uh, at the time? But, yeah. you know, and then I went into the stout mode when I first started brewing. I thought stout was king. Mm-hmm. And, um, IPA was always one of my favorites, but you know, uh, just, uh, at Lacumbre, I got to brew half of, uh, the, the beer batch, beer, beer, Lacumbre beer, uh, that won half gold. And maybe it was part of that partial of that. Uh, but, uh, it was yeah, just, you know, the, the nuance and then, uh, and the, how hard it is to make a lager and the, the variation in lager, you know, there's a lot of different subtle nuances that can make beer. So make a lager great. Yeah. I think, uh, one eye-opening like taste test I did was I had like a Pilsner Urkel, which is oh, you're good. Um, a Czech. Uh huh. Czech pills. Yeah, I had that, and then I forget what else I had, but just it was another Pilsner, and just side by side, yeah. and I found that like side by side for me is I have to do like two or three things side by side, you know, sitting down, sure. kind of calm mm-hmm. to really start to pick out flavors. I mean. I don't really think I have a great palate. Yeah. Um, so it's really only when I can literally compare things like side by side. Yeah. But that was kind of one of the things that uh, I was like, oh, yeah, shit, there's, you know. Oh, yeah. There's a lot of difference where it really you just is. had it standalone. Yeah. Chatting yeah. with somebody Chat, at yeah. a party it's, or whatever. You never, yeah, 100%. <laughs> yeah. I agree. It took me maybe four years to be even really able to taste through a lot. And, and I'm, I'm, I still learn all the time. And, you know, uh, they make off flavor kits. You can dose beer and you can learn all that stuff. But you know, that stuff. So, so uh, every off flavor is in different um, quantities in a beer, you know, so different thresholds. Mm. Uh, so it takes a long time. And, and, you know, every hop, Czech hops are different than German hops and different malts. And there's a lot of little nuanced things to look at there. So, yeah. What, um, I'm trying to think, cause there's, so, I mean, there's so many aspects to beer. I mean, it's such a, it's such a huge industry now and it's so trendy now. For sure. Um, you know, I always joke with my friend that, you know, it, it, the hipsters take over everything eventually yes. and it's coffee and beer and all the things which I do enjoy. I'm mean, yes. not knocking hipsters because yeah. I'm basically one at this point. Yeah. But um, it is interesting when you see things go through the phases of change. Yeah. My only reference point with beer is way back in the day, uh, 2006, yeah. Il Vicino had the tap room. Um, over with that wood, uh, what is it, the Carpenter's Kill? Yeah, kind of? I never went there, but I know you're talking about where it's at. So my dad would, uh, he, it's so close to the shop, right? Yeah. So we would like, and actually bef- there was a dirt lot that was next to the f- to the uh, frontage road back yeah. then. And that Carpenter's Union was not there, all dirt. So my dad would, he got me a dirt bike, like a little, uh, like a two-stroke. Yeah. It was a like a Suzuki RM85, uh-huh. little little wiry two stroke. Yeah. And that was my first motorcycle. Yeah. But what he would do is we would drive over there. I'd go rip around on that thing in the dirt lot and he'd just go to the tap room. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd ride around, get tired, I'd go over and they would brew they had root beer and okay. they still brew as far as I know, they still brew the like one of the best root beers in the state, um, at El Vicino. Never had it. And do that root beer. <laughs> at, at one point i was like man there's gotta be some alcohol in here because it was so fucking strong and uh, but it was like just it was like a true root beer with yeah. like the sarsaparilla root yeah and yeah yeah you could tell that it was just you know it's like it was not like sugary ibc yeah and anything like no, that for sure um so anyway that just a long story of like my first memories with beer was that little tiny tap room right in my dirt Never bike drinking root beer okay, yeah but back then it was like going to the tap room wasn't really a thing that I could remember. No. It was I, so few and far between, and now it's, you know, every yeah, neighborhood. Yeah, my experience, the first experience with beer was uh, uh, in Farmington, uh, where I'm from, in uh, northern New Mexico. Uh, we had uh, a Three Rivers Brewing Company, and uh, several of my buddies in high school, um, 
maybe in high school. Uh, no, actually in high school. Yeah. Uh, we're cooks and chefs and stuff there. And, uh, you know, we, we I drank Keystone. I drank the cheap stuff, Coors and stuff, Coors Light. Um, but they would go, we'd have parties out in the hills and they would get, uh, uh, you know, kegs of scotch ale or whatever oh it was i don't you know and we drink that stuff <laughs> and we didn't know how we didn't know if we liked the taste or whatever we knew it we knew what the effects were yeah. and uh yeah it's like double the proof of oh, triple yeah. the proof of yeah even yeah if, like, abv yeah for sure yeah yeah and uh yeah that's we just knew it was uh it would trash us a lot more so we liked it but yeah, I mean, yeah, it's a, it's it's kind of at its infancy. A lot of people think oh, Albuquerque is crowded. It's got too many breweries, and uh, maybe somewhat true, you know. But uh, I, I think there's still some room for growth, and I think uh, throughout the state, there's a lot of room, more room, and they'll probably continue to be so. I'll just hope that people uh, take the time to actually learn how to do it right because we're pretty blessed here. Our quality's high. I guess that's a question I have for you: is when you go to Denver, there's so many breweries up there, and like I feel like you can. It's a you know, kind of a long shot sometimes maybe to get a really good one where I feel like maybe our, you tell me, what do you think as far as the, the quality of the beer here versus up there? Uh, it's real incestuous here. You know, we have, everybody's kind of from the same <laughs> yeah. breweries and they've learned the same techniques mm -hmm. and not always, but. Yeah. You know, I, um, it's a, that's a tough one for me to answer. Yeah. Uh, just because I'm not as well versed in the technical quality sure. brewing aspects. Yeah. So I'm not sure that I could pick out what's wrong with the beers yeah. as much. I'm purely just going off flavor. Yeah. Um, I will say I'm very partial to Odell. Okay. Oh yeah. I mean, Great. like anything that they make, like oh, no, I just, no. I feel like that's my, for sure. that's my happy place. Uh, New Belgium is hit or miss for me. There's some that I like that they do and there's some that you know, are kind of wacky and I don't get. Yeah. Um, it seems like uh, if it's not, you know, honestly, if it's not like Odell, I, I rarely try new, I see, I don't seek out breweries anymore. For sure. I did a, I did a year or so with a buddy from college where we'd like drive around to all the you know, tap rooms and stuff. And, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I think the other problem too is like just when the menu rotates, Yeah. it's hard for me to really like remember, oh, I liked this one flavor, but it's different now and i yeah i haven't really had like a consistent uh you know tasting profile consistency is very hard in craft beer yeah uh, it's there's uh, so many variables you know and uh going back to the anheuser bush or InBev thing like, mm -hmm. it, they got it dialed in you know so it's hard yeah it, it's a it's a agricultural product agriculture changes barley changes hops change it's really hard to yeah. dial all that in all the time so that's uh, I, I was talking with my on my previous podcast with the uh, coffee roaster. Uh -huh. We kind of touched on that of when you're dealing with organic products, like shit changes every single time you pull it out of the ground. You know, <laughs> kind of beautiful though at the same time, right? right? I mean, that's where the art comes from. That's where the that's art comes the from the art of it's adapting to the change. I mean, yeah, to me it just seems like that's the human art form is adapting to yeah. change. Yeah. And you know, you can get poetic about it, but when it comes down to like when you're sourcing ingredients and you you probably know exactly when, oh, these ingredients are really good. These are solid. Sure. Um, and then I guess to bring it back, you'd mentioned that you think there's a lot of room for growth in the breweries here. Do you think that's technique, quality, consistency, or like just like what to brew? Um, I would say uh, drinkability is king. Um you know, you can make a double IPA all day and, you know, not, and people can come and have two, but grandpa's not going to want double IPA. You know, I give my, my, my stepdad an IPA and he wants to spit it out, you know, but, um, I think the trend is going to be more towards lager beer, maybe some of the easy drinking British, a uh, low ABV, a low ABV stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, you know, if you can appeal to everybody besides the hipsters and everybody that's posting on Instagram all the yeah. time, uh, there's a lot of room for growth that growth there. You know, a lot of people look at uh, old guys, especially, you know, sometimes look at craft beer, not all, but uh, some aren't really onto it, you know. And, and if they have something that tastes like Budweiser and it's a better uh, full malt, uh, great hop, Pilsner, whatever it might be, you know, something that they can relate to, there's still, there's still some room there, mm -hmm. I think. So. And do you think that's, do you think there's like, also a role of like educating the consumer. Um, oh, yeah. And yeah. you know, one thing that pops into my head right now is like the trend now is like what hard sparkling yeah, seltzer. seltzer, which 
I looked at the numbers. Uh, oh, it's nuts. Oh, my God. It's like it outsells Bud Light or some, something like oh, that. Yeah, yeah it it's, does. It does. Yeah, there's a there's a nationwide can shortage right now. <laughs> and everybody thinks it's because of some tariffs or whatever. Yeah. No, it's because there's a lot of, you know, uh, you know Bud Light. They are still producing Bud Light and all these crap breweries are demanding cans. But now we have a whole new market. <laughs> we have this whole seltzer market, some cider, some Jeez. alternative beverage. So now there's like double these can production facilities are really trying to to expand and if you've ever seen a can uh, aluminum can manufacturer they make breweries look like they dwarf them so you know it's 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 a weird time in that sense uh that is wild and and that like market seemingly didn't exist before right i think wasn't zima like back in the day wasn't that kind of yeah. seltzer i don't know maybe i'm wrong i haven't heard of that one oh um, zima. you don't remember that uh, no, <laughs> there was a commercial back in the day yeah anyways uh, that's funny yeah it's uh it's it's definitely uh it's weird as far as the seltzer thing i've heard it's harder to make than what you think it is mm-hmm. um obviously there's a few breweries here here making it and it's probably like those canned head. cocktails like i've had some of those canned cocktails yeah. and some of them taste like piss <laughs> but i've had a good one yeah and i forget what brand it was but you'd think it'd be easy right oh just you know throw it's like let's make a mule in a can yeah. cool just throw some vodka and some yeah. ginger beer and lime yeah. juice and you're good but i could see where yeah it's probably easy to fuck up and if it just just turns just a little bit or yeah. something you yeah, have the ratio off. yeah the ratio off yeah um, I, I would imagine so i yeah i stick to beer pretty heavily you know good I yeah i don't get too <laughs> i don't know i don't get too i don't drink booze too much or anything but yeah. beer's my thing so, yeah yeah hmm that's that's i hadn't thought about the can side of it yeah it's a uh, massive shortage right now what what else is is there a shortage in because i mean i didn't even consider that like I mean, you think, you know, cans are everywhere. They're in every gas station, every grocery store. You'd never think that there could be a can shortage because we're so used to it, right? Uh, shortages, I don't, I can't really speak to anything in short. I would, going back to the knowledge shortage, yeah. um, there's a lot of knowledge shortage out there. I, I teach the draft systems class at CNM. And uh, as a brewer, you would think that, uh, you know, draft systems, uh, you put beer through a, a system and, and it's pretty simple mm-hmm. i was very ignorant to uh, a lot of the draft components and, mm-hmm. and and what goes into draft beer um joe schmogel's old bar out there uh the draft dirty the dirty draft components that are sitting around it, it's a food product you know stuff mm-hmm. that sits around there's a lot of dirty lines sitting around that are nasty ignorance of yeah. cleaning people do you know they don't think about cleaning that stuff draft systems are are designed improperly Bartenders, 90, 95% of them don't have any idea how to clean lines, um, how it drafts, how this, the nature of CO2, what's causing foaming, how to prevent that, mm. why, don't turn up the keg. You know, there's there's a lot of lack of knowledge, especially on the, I'd say on the draft side, on the on the serving side. Mm. Uh, and, and, and having this class at CNM, I wish, you know, we have a lot of brewery people, people in the program that are just going into brewing industry. I would love to see bartenders come in and take this class. Mm. Um, cause you know, if they can un- troubleshoot a draft system at, at 1230 at night or, or 1030 at night when the owner's at home and they understand the physics of what's going on mm-hmm. or the cleaning it, whatever it is, um, it's, it's good for everybody. You know, we don't, nobody needs to waste beer, pour it down the drain, pouring foam all the time or serve dirty beer. You know, that's just not, not acceptable. It's a, you spend a lot of money on a five, $6 pint. Uh, if you're aware, probably maybe a little more in Denver or California, I paid like $13 a pint or something, you know, something yeah. ridiculous. And, you know, like if you pay that much money for it, it should be coming out clean. There's just so many, so many things that can be issues. So, so that's a, that's a big shortage in knowledge, especially on the draft side. Hmm. I, that takes me back to, um, event bartending where we'd, we'd have to roll out a jockey box every, yep. we did like weddings and stuff. Yep. It was at like, uh, just like a city center, you know, uh-huh. just a big ballroom. Yep. Um, and I remember like getting the basic training of like, okay, here's your jockey box. Here's your CO2 canister. Yeah, yeah. And here's how you hook it up. Um, for people that don't know, you know, they have no idea how it comes out of that, yeah. that spout. Um, just give us like a basic breakdown of beers in a keg in the back. And then how does it get out into your $6 glass? <laughs> you got a drawing board? Yeah. You draw this out. Well, I mean, there's a lot of different systems and, and far as far as uh, how to deliver beer. If you're talking about a jockey box, it's somewhat straightforward. The biggest cause of foam foaming is a big loss for some places. If their beer is just pouring out foam, they're just wasting beer, dumping it down the drain. Uh, so heat, if a uh, if your cold room's not operational, if you have to tra- tra- uh, move beer across a certain distance, it's not 
in a cold room. Mm-hmm. That beer needs to be contacting glycol and, and, and be chilled the entire length of the run. Uh, if you ever go to a, a bar and you see just like the draft tower or whatever sweating and, and sometimes, you know, this is a oh, pretty yeah, like thing. On the handle? Dri- like yeah, on okay. the handle. I mean, that could be a sign of pouring a lot, but, mm-hmm. um, you know, if there's foaming coming out or whatever, that might, that beer line might not be chilled the entire mm. run. So hmm. um, there's, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of draft systems. As I said, it's, I was very ignorant. I kind of got thrown into the class and, hey, you, you want to teach this? And I said, well, again, I'll, I'll sign up and do it. Mm. They sent me to LA and taught me, took me to a school, but I've had to do a lot of, or sent me to a school, you know, enough, but I had to do a lot of research and learning my own. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, yeah, the biggest thing is, is CO2 is served uh, with pressure. It's, there's no, I mean, there can be pumping in rare instances, um, but it's basically a, it's, at a pool party. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> those hand actually the hand pump thing blew my mind. Like I didn't know how this worked, but when you hand pump those kegs um, and you pour it in your solo cup, it goes flat really fast. I had no idea that. Yeah. Cause it's taking atmosphere, which is not a hundred percent CO2. That's why it goes yeah, flat. I mean, very little. Yeah. It's a lot of nitrogen, but it's not the same as like an, like a, a nitro beer yeah, in the, no, in the slightest. No. Right. So that blew my mind. I was like, oh, that totally makes sense. It's what air, what, you know, gas are you pressurizing and running through? Correct. Yeah. So you, and also if you do that, the keg, you're oxidizing the beer, you're pulling oxygen. Oxygen is the Mm. number one enemy of beer. Um, So if you're pulling oxygen in your environment, uh, that beer is only Mm. good for maybe 24 hours. You don't want to drink, I mean, unless you're really desperate, you want to drink it the next day. (laughs) Uh, You know, oxygen on that, on that component, like, you know, uh, buying craft beer in a, in a can, Warm stored beer is not as good as cold stored beer. Every day a, a beer sets warm is equal to one week of cold storage. Or every day a, a a beer sets cold is equal to one week of warm storage. So if a beer is setting out on the shelf warm, uh, it's going to deteriorate faster. Wow. Beer is the, is the least shelf stable of all alcohol types. So, hmm. um, yeah. So is that purely based on proof or is it just a number of factors? Uh, 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 it's, it's, I'd say it's higher hopping rates is going to make the beer. Okay. Uh, hops and oxygen have a, mm-hmm. uh, adverse reaction. Mm-hmm. Um, but any beer is going to deteriorate pretty fast, you know? Um, so you probably don't want to go to the corner store and uh, those that, you know, sometimes those... <laughs> Those fridge like doors don't always close, you know, when you go no. to those janky gas stations. No, and... well, that or if they're even <laughs> like that, that cold sport base is, is usually reserved for the big guys, you know, and yeah. Anheuser Busch. They're gonna have the distributors in their pocket and they'll have those, those, uh, all that in, in line. But you know, always, uh, another thing is always flip your can over. A lot of people don't ever look at the mm-hmm. bottom of the can and see when that thing was packaged. Mm-hmm. If it's three months, four months old, it's on the end of its end of its life, you know? Yeah. Even, even longer than that. I don't buy it. But again, I guess that's the snob of me, but yeah, well, you're lucky you're right. At the source, you know, pretty often. So yeah. Yeah. The source is the best place. Yeah. And that's the freshest. And, and actually the, uh, the economics of beer too, right? Like I've heard, you know, every, every mile away from the brewery or from, you know, the brewing, uh, equipment, any amount of distance between that, like just the quality, you're just on a losing battle with quality because be. if your truck isn't a refrigerated truck yeah. or it's kind of what you're talking about, like yeah. there's so many things that will, do, you know, it'll, the quality will go down. For sure. Uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, the, the older it is, it's just, just the nature of it, you know, uh, the further out, more states you go to, the, the less quality. I mean, a lot of the big New Belgium, Sierra Nevadas mm-hmm. and stuff there, I, I don't know if I could say those ones in particular, but a lot of the bigger regional crop breweries are scaling back because it's such a big footprint mm-hmm. and they're competing with local guys that are putting out fresher uh, beer that's uh, right there in their neighborhood and people love to buy their local stuff and they're just not able to compete, you know, so. Yeah, it's, it seems like more, the more I learn about different markets, like man that shit, that shit seems hard it seems oh, like so competitive and yeah it's like unreal that people get you know they it's unreal that people carve out their own niche and make yeah, you know it really is make a living and yeah. especially when it's you know people you know and it's a family that owns a business and yeah. like it's it's fucking hard like i yeah you I guys totally would respect know. it you guys would know here i mean you guys i mean you guys uh, do some been doing this a long time what you guys do so yeah um what uh What's it like? Because I know you've been either, you know, directing the beer, or you know, interacting with the owners or ownership. Or um, what's it like? Just uh, give and take, and you know, if you have some ideas, you know, just trying to like bring up some new flavors and whatnot. Uh, 
very simple. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a very pretty straightforward process. I, uh, Anne and Dan at Sidetrack are super open to things. I don't try to do anything off the wall for the most part. Um, we try very, again, subtle, nuanced approaches to beer. Um, slight modifications, maybe something new here, something new there. Uh, we got a couple of things in the works, which might be kind of uh, innovative, I should say, not not for us, but for the area. Um, trying some new styles that are kind of being innovated in other places. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, we, we, again, resort to beer flavored beer and we just do stuff that's, we're not reinventing the wheel. We're trying to, you know, make, make stuff that's drinkable and people want to come in and just, uh, uh, there's a place called Beerstadt Lager House in, have you ever been there in uh, Denver? No. Uh, they're a traditional German brewery. They have three beer, three German beers on tap and then they have a seasonal German beer and they're all same one, uh, one yeast, one hop, hmm. and then the malt's the, the biggest change. Um, I agree with them in the fact that, uh, I, we always going to make great beer. Um, but you know, the beers, we aren't trying to be what wine is. I don't want to, we don't want to be too snobby. We're, we're neighborhood pubs are really what you are. Yeah. And we're, we're, you know, we want the beer to be secondary to the conversation. We were, we're here to, to facilitate a place that people can hang out, enjoy the beer and, you know, uh, and make great beer and just let people have great conversations and, and, and not be, uh, you know, double IPA this and, uh, uh, you know, stick up our, you know, asses. <laughs> so that's, that's a great way to put it. And that's something that I, you know, you know, it when you see it and you know, it when it's not, there's the community, yeah. nice place to be. Yeah. You do. You just want to go hang out with people, meet new people. Yeah. Um, and yeah, at the end of the day, you know, I, I always focus on the business side of things and I'm interested in that and the economics of it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like. Yeah, it's all about just hanging out and conversing, and yeah, uh, it's been tough this last year, you know, because it's you got to get in, get out to go. Yeah, um, we're getting back to it though. Yeah, um, seems like it. What's that been like? Just you know, what do you like in a brewery vibe wise, and how hard is it to create it? Because you've you know you've done it. Yeah, I've done it, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's. It's 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 almost like you have to let it be what it, what what the neighborhood wants it to be, mm -hmm. not what you want it to be. You know, you can influence your ego on it all you want, mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it's kind of who who's coming into your place. And and uh, you know, we we at Sidetrack we have Zindo Coffee, which is next to us. A lot of the same cross clientele coming in. Um, you know, uh, so so you know, if you try to influence influence it with your ego, uh, it's probably gonna slap you in the face and tell you what it should be. So, I know that's what the case was with Sidetrack. Um, I'd imagine a lot of breweries have that 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 issue. So hmm. I shouldn't say issue, but yeah, yeah, it's it's a, it's a challenge. Uh, yeah, no matter which way you slice it. Uh, what's your what are your thoughts on opening other locations? You know, because I've seen that nowadays where, yeah, yeah, it's realize the city's big. People don't, people don't want to drive all the way across town. You know, let's just open up another place. You know, is it? Uh... Um, mm, yeah, it's something definitely. It's not, it's a it's a very uh, it's a very good thing to do if you if you if you're trying to expand and you have the production capacity. Mm -hmm. um, is it hard to replicate the consistency at both places, or if you um, get new equipment, maybe like well, the old... majority of breweries that do that, they they produce at one location. Okay. Marble might be the exception to that, mm -hmm. um, but you know, uh, produce at one location and distribute to the others. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's that would be the biggest. Uh, thing so it'd be pretty, pretty much the same product going out mm -hmm. but I get what you're saying though if, they, if it was different one batch is at one location and different in another location again most consumers are, are, are not quite up to you know to par on that unless the beer is just way off but right. um, there's always going to be some kind of subtle nuance for the most part um, yeah what uh talk about that like getting the getting to that point where you're able to feel the nuance in your brewing process like how long did it take you or I guess start with how long do you think it took to educate yourself before you're like, okay, give me the reins. Like I got, I got it. Uh, do I have it yet? <laughs> That's the biggest thing. That's, no, I, 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 I am, I'm very self-critical and I know when a beer is good and when a beer is bad and I'm never afraid to dump a beer if it's, you know, I don't want to put out anything that's mm -hmm. inferior. Sometimes things aren't come out exactly what you want. Um, but I, it, for me, it, it took me, and I was very uh, um, 
lacking of ego in the fact that I never acted like I, I knew exactly what was going on. Um, I think that's a big issue we've had in, in, in craft beer is mm. a lot of people, um, for whatever reason, beer is the one thing that somebody brews a couple batches in their garage and then their buddies come over and they get hammered on it and they think it's the best thing in the world and now it's they're ready to open a craft brewery for whatever reason. If you're, you know, if you're a cook, you don't do that. If you're a welder, you don't do that. If you're a whatever it is, you don't do that. But beer, crab beer is something that a lot of people do that with. I knew I knew for four years I didn't know Jack. You know, I didn't know shit. I knew I did know. I tried doing more than most people, but I, I, I still learn all the time. Um, it's a and it's if anything, if you're smart, it's a never ending process, and you're always learning, and you got to stay up to date. And um, yeah, it's 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 I, I question myself all the time, and I think that's what makes somebody. It's a good brewery. You have to always be questioning yourself. So no, that's good. That's uh, I, I tend to see that the people that are really good in their field, mm -hmm. whatever it is, yeah, yeah, they they're always learning. That's yeah. kind of the key. It's have like to. a common thread. Yeah, you have to exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, you're gonna yeah. you're gonna get beat by the next person that's yeah. you know on their game. Yeah, I'm a I'm a uh, voracious learner. I I'm always learning things. Uh, you know, in today's day and age, it's so easy. We were talking about YouTube earlier. How you learned how to set up all this? Like mm -hmm. I YouTube all the time. I don't watch TV. I watch YouTube. I learn yeah. about my truck or I learn you know whatever cooking whatever it is. But you know, I'm not really into uh, being stagnant and and uh, it's just, it's just too too much fun to not to, you know, whatever yeah. it is. So. Where do you go for, um, like, do you keep up to date on brewery techniques like on YouTube or are there other like sources or friends maybe? Friends. Yeah. Uh, inquiring with other people. Uh, there's a lot of good references as far as uh, podcasts. There's a master brewers association of America's podcast. Oh. There's a craft beer and brewing podcast. There's a, you know, cool. you go in an interview with people that are really doing innovative stuff. That's a really good way to do it. I'm, I'm more of an audible learner than I am, this, mm -hmm. or you know, hands-on learner mm -hmm. than uh, reading. I, I, I've read plenty, but uh, and I'm getting back into it. Um, I'm pr making myself read. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, you, uh, YouTube has a lot of ways not to do the things the wrong way as far as homebrewers go and stuff. There's yeah. some stuff on there, but that's it. I actually mentioned the um, those podcasts again, um, like the Master guilds. Oh, uh, Master Brewers Association of America's okay. um, been doing it since the 1800s. They're a great educational resource. Okay, cool. And then uh, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. A um, couple guys are very knowledgeable on beer, uh, production beer. Um, and they, they, their podcast is really cool. They actually kind of go and interview the brewers that are doing good and doing th big things cool. uh, throughout all the, around the country. So Yeah, I find that that's um, – it's funny. Podcasts are underrated for – I guess technical learning for sure because they can be fragmented and yeah. it, you're not exact always exactly sure who um, whose podcast it is or for sure if they're qualified. I mean, for sure. I'm, I'm not qualified for half the shit I do, but uh, but I think in that regard, it's you will find some gems. You're like, holy shit! Like this is a great absolutely, especially if it's like an association and they have good yeah. production value. And yes, um, but I didn't even think about that because you know I've learned. I go into coffee, you know, I've yeah. gone down that rabbit hole and, yeah. um, you know, like pick, pick whatever you're interested in cooking, um, any skill, any kind of job related skill, like you're going to find like a rabbit hole to go down sure. and keep learning. And if you're interested, it's you know going to make you better. Yeah. Um, but how, then how do you go from, okay, you get a new piece of information. When do you, uh, do you just kind of work it in with your workflow? Sometimes I'll be, I'll be, uh, uh, the beauty of being, uh, the only brewer in a brewery, uh, is that you're by yourself a lot. And nice. I always have, if you're see me at the brewery, I always have one headphone in oh, cool. and that might be me listening to music. That might be me listening to a podcast or audio book or whatever, but I'm again, always have something in this year. Hmm. Um, I try to take it off and be one with the process at times, um, because that's important too. You know, you hmm. want to, you want to almost be meditative and, and be, you know, our, our, we're kind of a. Uh, with the, the kings of Frankenbrew, we've pieced together our system. There's no pushing buttons and moving some beer mm. around or anything. So uh, it's really our, our very, very hands on in our process. Um, so um, yeah, but yeah, there's a. Uh, I'm, I sometimes I'll be listening to a, a Master Brew Associated American podcast, and I'll I'll be implementing that technique while I'm doing it. So cool. that's really it's really cool in that sense, you know. So nice, yeah. I identify with that completely because you know out in the shop. Yeah. There's some things we have to concentrate and, you know, yeah. no distraction. But 
uh, for the most part, like once you get in a groove or if you're doing a batch production of sure. things you do all the time, yeah, I'm the same way. Always got podcast or yeah. audiobook yeah. or music and yeah, um, yeah. That's just it. It's sort of it's a weird balance. Some it days, really is. And some days, actually, I should ask you about this too. Is like that beer's got to go out. That beer's got to get made. You know, they've got a schedule. They've got open hours. Like you've got to get your shit done, regardless of whether you're in a bad mood or not, or you know, something breaks or something. You know, you have to fix something in yeah. in the lines. Um, you know, working in the shop, like every day, there's going to be something that doesn't go right, or something breaks, or you yep. got to fix something, and. Yep could totally throw you off, off your off your game yeah um what's it like when there's you know i'd say even more of a deadline with beer and with a quantity you know you don't want to fuck up a whole quantity of beer i mean because that's I've done it that's a lot. <laughs> I've done it a lot of times <laughs> yeah. um it hurts it hurts more right yeah <laughs> yeah um there you know there's a there's always something to, to fix in a brewery for sure. Just like any kind of, you know, production, mechanical, uh, you know, anything with mechanics, yeah. there's going to be something to fail. Yeah. Um, but uh, luckily I have, uh, I was raised in a, in a, a blue collar town. Where I learned how to do a lot of that stuff uh, and just was kind of raised that way. Uh, brewing is not just um, making beer. There's plumbing, there's electrical, mm -hmm. there's uh, maintenancing equipment. So yeah, there's always those gonna be those things, but you take it as they come. I, I I never try to rush a beer. If we run out of a beer, I've made the mistake of rushing them, and uh, they don't come out as good. Um, and I've made the mistake of putting on a beer that shouldn't have been put on and had to dump it later. Um, so uh, it's all a learning process. It the whole thing's a process. And um, if things you just just in life, you just got to deal with the problems as they come. You know. So yeah. Yeah, I mean, hey, that's that's good advice for any any time. Yeah, um, there's always gonna be problems in life. Like that's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's. Uh, I I've started, you know, just working on stuff here in the shop. I've uh, I've been listening to a podcast, uh, Andrew Huberman. Uh -huh. um, yeah, I know familiar. He's, yeah, I've never listened to him, but I know who he is. Yeah, dude, he's great. Is he? um, I'll check it out. He's fantastic. He's a neurobiologist and op ophthalmologist, uh -huh. but he makes everything relatable. Okay. He's sort of like the the Richard Feynman of this okay. kind of generation yeah. of what his topic is. But today, like I just learned from him that the uh, it's called a physiological sigh where you do like a double inhale and then exhale. So it's like, huh. it's apparently like your body just does it naturally, but you can consciously do it when you're stressed. And I've started implementing that when I'm working hmm. and it's immediate, it's fast, and you can consciously do it. And it's just one little thing where instead of something kind of unraveling on yeah, you and yeah. it getting, you know, gets on your skin, because, you know, I'll, I'll lose it. Like, I've gotten some projects go south on me. Sure. And yeah. when you get to that moment, you're like, ah, oh, fuck, I got to redo yeah. this. Yeah. You know, I learned better ways of dealing with yeah. it. But the whole point of that is just, it's just little things here and there yeah. that you just implement. Yeah. And it helps you out in your day. Yeah, the breath is uh, going on to that topic. I'm, I've been, I just got done with a book called Breath, re, uh, reading a book about that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been familiar with the Wim Hof stuff. I'm yeah. familiar with him. Huberman addresses that stuff specifically. Yeah. It's pretty fascinating. It's fascinating. It's... You know, I've been doing this thing at night uh, called mouth taping. If you've heard of that, you tape your mm. mouth shut and you breathe through your nose because really you're mm. supposed to. Right. Your nose is your filtration system and you breathe through that. and. Mm. I've been sleeping better, and uh, dude, you sleep with like what duct tape over your mouth? Uh, it's like... I tried some different tape. That way you just get some like uh, you know, uh, medical tape or whatever they call it, surgical tape, and do yeah. it. It's weird. It's weird, but it, it, it there's something to it. Do you wake sure. you wake up and you just feel totally I feel different? Feel great. Yeah, I slept, I slept through the night. Sometimes I'd have sleeping problems. You know, and another thing with drinking is uh, you know, sometimes that can mess with your sleep. And um, been taking a little break lately, but yeah, it's a uh, yeah, I feel you, man. Like I, the one thing I like about the Apple Watch, yeah, which I kind of the only reason I have it is, uh, you know, heart rate, sleep tracking. Um, and you can totally see, like you check it in the morning. It's like, if you drink a lot the night before you wake up or you check the app, it's like, oh yeah. Like heart rate higher when you're sleeping. And what generation do you have? Because I had the first one and I destroyed it. I don't know. Yeah. This is the six. Oh, so it's pretty, it's, it's got the new, yeah. It's got the blood oxygen too. Oh, wow. Which, that one's actually, I don't, you know, I don't know how accurate it is. Yeah. Um, it's accurate enough. Yeah. But yeah, sometimes you'll wake up and like, you'll be like, oh shit, like I probably, 
yeah, it's probably like drink more water, breathe more, like yeah, not yeah, drink yeah. so much. You just start noticing those things. And, you know, this has been like one hell of a year to try and like, yeah. you know, to try yeah. and like taper off on, on all that stuff. But, yeah. um, yeah, it, it's just those little things, you know, that you, it, as long as you're conscious of it, I yeah, think. For sure. Yeah, I've, I've, I would be interested to check out the sleep tracking and all that on that and see how that works. And it just knows my movement. Or? Yeah, I think it, so it does like, it's definitely, it's movement. And then like it knows when you like sit up or stand up. Okay. So I don't know if it uses like whatever. The, it's probably all just the accelerometer. Yeah. Um, and the software, but it's like pretty fucking accurate. Like, okay. like I'll know when I wake up middle of the night, next morning I'll check, but like, yep, I got it. Wow. Yeah. I'd um, like to get, I'd go back on one then. Yeah. I had the first and, gen and I destroy okay. things. So. Yeah. Well, I got my, uh, my dad had one and uh -huh. I think like, I was like, dad broke, put a case on that. Yeah. <laughs> like, put a, like one of those big ass, like G-Shock cases. For sure. Um, and he, he didn't, and he, it was like a week later, Trashed it. <laughs> rolled up his sleeve and it just like crumbled out because <laughs> we were, we were moving like some big ass gates or something yeah. like that. And I'm pretty good. I usually wear like hoodies and I just do a sleeve over it. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, Surely you have a class case on that top of that, right? I do. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Got oh yeah. On that. Yeah. Yeah. The metal shop, it would. Yeah. Trash it. Yeah. yeah. But it, it is waterproof, so you yeah, know, for beer and you know all that. Yeah, the one I had the first gen was like I my hands are in buckets of sanitizer all day, and it was like mm. water resistant, whatever the different uh, something like that. And yeah, speaker stopped working, mm. and it was just anyways. Yeah. yeah, I think from the first gen until now they're a they're pretty solid now, yeah. and they don't really change them a whole lot. Like even like a five, a four, or five would probably be fine okay. too. But uh, yeah, it's. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I've seen all the whoop straps and all that mm. kind of stuff. And I've thought about that, but I just got to have a membership and I've heard bad things, good things. You know? Yeah. So if you can get it all on your watch and it syncs up, I, don't know, I might try that out. Yeah, I thought about the whoop strap because yeah. it's, there's no screen, which yeah. I, honestly, I don't, I don't interact with this thing. It's, yeah. I don't need another screen. Yes. Um, sure. So that's what was appealing about the whoop. And you just, it seemed more robust. Mm -hmm. But same thing, like, it's like, do I want a membership for this? And you yeah. use their app. And, you know, with Apple, it's like maybe a little more open source. Yeah. There's different, you can get different apps. Yeah. Um, for sure. So yeah, I don't know. Yeah, man. That's a, it's, 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 it's in a time nowadays where we can just analyze everything, you know, everything's under a microscope and. You can overanalyze too. Yeah. I mean, I'm just my personality type. Like I overanalyze yeah. all the time and yeah. that gets, that gets, uh, it gets, it just drains energy, really. Yeah. I mean, you can learn to manage it and deal with it, but it, at the end of the day, it just it drains energy. Yeah, um, for sure. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's so funny because just talking to you, um, I mean, I've never really sat down with you for more than five, ten minutes. Yeah. But, um, yeah, there's, like, a lot of similarities. And, for sure. You know, when you kind of, you know, like you said, like that blue-collar kind of background. Yeah ethos yeah you kind of just recognize that people and yeah you know especially people that like learning yeah um, yeah it's uh it's 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 hard i mean you know i uh being from a blue collar town and coming and living in the city i i'm more and more crave to be back and 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 and, and not in the city you know kind of burnt mm -hmm. out on the city um, but there's a huge divide between you know blue collar america and the city america and i, and I, I, I find it sad you know because not everybody in in blue collar america's like uh you know redneck trump people and then ever not everybody in the city is a bunch of crazy psycho liberal uh, you know blue haired whatever there's a real i mean everybody right. just needs to have a better understanding of each other and you know and then, i don't know i've been able to see both sides because i'm from trump country and i mm -hmm. now i live in you know opposite and I don't know. It's 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 weird, and and I just uh I don't know. I'm 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 wish that for a time where we could all be kind of just Americans, and you know I don't know. That's yeah, political, but yeah. Anyways. I mean, I I totally get it though, because it's you'll find commonality with almost everybody. It's yeah. you're not going to be common. You're not going to have common um, you know, ways of thinking. Maybe maybe not. But yeah. everybody eats. Everybody sure. drinks beer. Everybody drinks sure. water. Everybody sleeps. Everybody yeah. has a family. Yeah. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's like you you can at least relate to almost everybody on just those basics of being a human. Yeah, and and that's ninety percent of it. You know, like uh, the news is, shows a lot, a lot, all the bad stuff, but there is not. It's not like that when you, my day to day life, your day to day yeah. life. I'd imagine, oh, yeah. you know. So 
That's, that is such a hard thing these days of like, yeah, I see everything out there on the screens, but if I really analyze my day to day, yes, it hasn't changed that much. No, who, it isn't. whoever, yeah, I mean, and you kind of, you kind of have to follow your own, follow your own narrative to a degree, as long sure. as you're not out of touch with reality. Yeah. There's a balance and, uh, I don't know. I'm just, <laughs> I, I, yeah, the more and more I, 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 yeah, the older I get, the less I want to watch screens and watch all that stuff and see what's going on in the news because it's all money driven. And, you know, it's who knows what, what you're really, again, we were talking about in the shop, but I feel like it's hard to even know it's real anymore, you know, especially if you're on the screens and social media all the time, you know, Instagram's cool because yeah. it's just pictures and stuff for the most part. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, that's, I use Instagram purely as like a business tool yes. and I, tr I try and not come off as like, I'm just using this for like, marketing or I'm not trying to sell everybody on every, everything, yeah. but it is a nice place when you can kind of get it to like, Oh, I just want to check in on my friends and see what they're up to. And yeah. you know, don't, don't go to the fucking, uh, suggested page. Yeah. Cause that's like, it's like, Hey, how about everything that you're slightly interested in? We're just going to like concentrate yeah. it and then just, you know, give you the full dose. For sure. I stopped looking at that page yeah. and that made my experience way better. Yeah. I've, I've, I don't have any of the apps on my phone. The only time I'm able to get on that stuff is when I'm on my computer. And I oh, like, you know, like I went out of town back home this weekend and I didn't, my mom doesn't have internet and I don't bring my computer and I don't get on it. And you know, you have that in your pocket all the time. You're on that thing all the time. I'm on it all the time here yeah. and there, but I'm not on social media because I don't have the ability to, to do it. That's actually a good uh, strategy that I've, I've considered that where you delete the social apps on your phone only on your computer. So yeah. it's like, you really can't do it during the day. Yeah. Unless you're carrying around your computer all the time, you know, yeah. but, uh, not many people do that. So, hmm. yeah. yeah, but I, you know, I, I want to circle back and bring it around to something you said earlier that at the end of the day, you just want a community. And yeah. I think that's, that's like the one thing that I've always respected about the beer industry is yeah. that, you know, it's, it's not rocket science. You make something that's yeah. good quality, charge a fair price for it. Yep. Um, you pay the people that made it a fair, fair wage. Yeah. Um, and when you explain that to your customers, I think people are so happy to support you. Yeah. Um, I've always felt like that at Sidetrack. Yeah. They, it, it always just feels like you walk in there and it's like, it feels a little more like you're, Great, but yeah. Yeah. And that's like kind of the, I don't know. It's hard. It, you, you can never plan that. No, absolutely. The vibe there is, uh, it's so laid back and, you know, people, it's welcoming and it's fun. You can just, yeah, it's just something in the air almost is mm -hmm. where, you know, and every place has its own vibe. Everybody has its, sometimes you might, and it just depends on you, but I don't feel like side drives a place you come in and uh, anybody feels unaccepted. You know, it's, it's very uh, open and free and fun loving. And yeah, it's a, just a great vibe place. Yeah. So, uh, and also just in, in general here in New Mexico, uh, kind of things are very incestuous as far as people that work in industry, people, Brewery, head brewer goes for another brewery, one brewery to another, and he's yeah. been he's worked at this place, and everybody stemmed from the Cumbre, Marble, Chama, uh, wherever it is, and uh, you know, so we have a real tight um, community as far as brewers go, and everybody knows everybody. I'd imagine if you went to Denver, not everybody knows everybody, or um, some of the bigger brewing communities. So we're we're real tight here, you know, for the most part. There is somewhat of a click if you're not in the click. Uh, mm. That might not be the case, but it's, it's, if you make good beer here and you're, and you know, everybody, it's, 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 it's a great community. So. Yeah. That's a, that is a good point that the beer industry, uh, when you get to like the scale, um, it's an interesting landscape. Uh, cause you know, when I was at CSU up there in school, um, like I did all the tours at New Belgium, Odell, yeah. even the smaller places yeah. too. And, you know, I thought Odell was big and then I saw New Belgium and then you, so back then it was a different story, but when you then look at like the national chart of yeah. like New Belgium is, oh, it's tiny. tiny compared to yeah. that. So that was sort of an eye opening thing. Did you ever do the Budweiser tour I, North? I did the, I had like, I got like a half tour. Okay. It wasn't the full thing. Yeah. But yeah, and then you just, you drive way the fuck out there. It's yeah. just enormous. It's like, yeah. if it were, uh, if there were neon lights on it and it was dark, it would, you'd be like, oh, this is like Blade Runner. Yeah. Because it's such a huge building yeah. in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. I, I did the New Belgium tour and I couldn't, my, I was, my mind was blown. I'm like, yeah. this is it's just so big. And then I went and did the, 
the uh, Anheuser Busch one on the to the north end of town there, and you're just like, and there's like twelve of those or something crazy in the country, and it's just mind mind numbing how big those places are. Yeah, yeah, and so it gives you a good uh, uh, sense of scale when you walk into your local place and realize, yeah. oh, cool, here's the head brewer. I'm gonna go talk to him. Yeah, you know, chat. Yeah, they're the owners. I'm gonna go chat with yeah. them. Yeah, um, it's great. It's it is like a perfect. Uh, I guess balance and antidote to just this crazy globalization sort of yes everything's really connected is. and especially when you think about like you can go to Whole Foods or Jubilation they've got all the imported beer there and you realize oh my god like the whole rest of the world all has their own beer yeah um, sometimes it's nice to just go back to your little community yeah. and yeah. people you know and again getting it from the source too it's like always fresher it's always better it tastes better on draft you yeah. know so. Yeah, there's something to that for sure. Yeah. I agree. The community aspect is awesome. So yeah, what uh, what do you got on the horizon beer wise? Is there anything that you're kind of working towards that, like someday maybe, like there's something special that you, um, you know, uh, we got a couple of things in the works. I'm gonna keep silent on them from now, but uh, uh, yeah, we we're, we'll we'll again just play with different nuanced styles and just. Go and again, keep using the word nuance, but nuance is a big, big deal with it. You know, is a uh, try a different hop variety. We're not uh, not trying to reinvent the wheel. Maybe try a new yeast strain or a new malt or whatever that is. Um, but as far as throwing, uh, you know, tons of fruit and all kinds of crazy, white random ingredients, we're yeah. not going to be doing any of that. That's just uh, trends and trends come and go and. Uh, classic beer styles uh, will always be around. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. So bloggers, 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 hopefully we can get some more tanks. Hopefully we can, we'll be working on a few new things this year. So cool. we got some big things on the horizon. So, and I think something maybe you guys would be helping us with, us with here soon, hopefully. So yeah, we'll see. Yeah. Uh, it's, I, I have a good feeling about this year. Um, I know there's a lot of, a lot of things you could pay attention to that are uh, less than satisfactory, but I tend to think that right now, it feels like people, uh, they got a good, a good kick in the pants yeah. this last year and had to readjust and reality you know. check. Yeah. And unfortunately not everybody's in, uh, like I mentioned, like we kept working, we had, we were actually a little busier. Um, you guys kept working as, as yeah. much as you could. Yeah. And, uh, it, uh, we're fortunate in that respect that we didn't just get the rug pulled out from under us. For sure. So I know there's a lot of people out there that are like really hurting, Yeah. but, um, I just, you know, I, through all of it, I've been able to keep a few tabs with people and it just feels like people are, you know, yeah. finding their footing again. Yeah. You know, it's a, a reset and a lot of things are in life are just perspective, you know, like it's maybe you lost your job and I, and that's very hard for me to, to, I'm not credit. I mean, that, but you know, I never want to say anything bad, but it's like, also there's people starving in the world, you know? So it's like a perspective thing. And, um, this is going to be a good perspective reset for a lot of people. And, uh, yeah. You know, I'm we're, I'm very blessed in the fact that I didn't lose anything, and as far as job wise goes, and you you either seems like you know, mm -hmm. but uh, perspective is a very important thing to, to to remember. So yeah, yeah. Well, good. Um, it's a good. I I always try and end on a positive note. Sure. Um, but uh, yeah, David, it's been uh, great talking to Thank you. Thank you, man. I really have had a great time with this. This yeah. is very exciting, very fun. I think there's definitely way more, you know, we could touch on so many things. Oh, and Yeah, I could go for hours. <laughs> go, yeah, I mean, and, you know, like I want to ask about like hop varieties and, sure. you know, do a lot of that stuff. But uh, maybe another day. Another day, another episode. Sure. We'll get into the weeds some more. Um, but for now, like, uh, you want to let it, uh, let everybody know, like, if they want, if you want to share anything. Sure. Uh uh, David Kimball on Instagram. I'm, I don't get too crazy on the social media, but Kraft Kimball, uh, last name's K-I-M-B-E-L-L. -L, so it's Kraft Kimball. Um, yeah, so follow me. Check me out. I don't post on there that much. I'm not that active. I try to live in this world, not on that one. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. Really appreciate sure. you. Sure, so. fair. And uh, stop by Sidetrack Brewing. In, Sidetrack uh, Brewing. Um, yeah, CNN Brewing Program. If you're a bartender, take the draft class. It's really important. Oh, yeah. Good note. Good note. There's a <laughs> check, lot. Check out the CNN Brewing Program. That's a great, great, uh, great uh, uh, outlet for those who uh, want to get into brewing or if you're interested in brewing, uh, come check it. We're building a, 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 a actually a brewery for educating students. Uh, cool. So that's in the works. That'll be done probably next year at some point. 
um, be actually a production, small production brewery where you can really learn how to do it rather than home brewing. So, um, yeah, Sidetrack Brewing, come check us out. Great beer. Nice. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll, uh, we will do it again sometime. Sounds good. Um, and uh, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. Appreciate you. All right. <laughs> 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 We're clear. We're clear. <laughs>